This hourly segment is brought to you by HealthQuest Radio with Dr. David Kolbaba. Saturday mornings at 11. Visit healthquestradio.com. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM560, The Answer. And, you know, I go back to the responsibility of Congress here, Mm -hmm. um, because had... Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. We were talking about uh, the arguments before the high court yesterday between... um, uh, and, the, and the issue of presidential immunity with uh, justices questioning both John Sauer, Trump's attorney, as well as uh, attorneys for the Department of Justice. And essentially, um, the argument that was advanced in the face of skepticism from justices about um, uh, criminalizing official acts of the president is um, you can trust the attorney general's. You can trust attorneys general, you know, prospectively. You can trust the DOJ prosecutors and you can trust grand juries. And that's all you need to know. Um, Somebody pointed out uh, a text from 847. Right. So we can trust the good character and ethical standards of prosecutors, but not presidents, of attorneys general, but not presidents. Oh, that's fine. So um, we've got a DOJ check on the president. Let's just play this argument out. And who's the check on the DOJ? And who trusts uh, the DOJ now, anyway? Who, who's the check on them? I, I don't know. Nobody. Uh, so, oh, you, you, what, what I'm sure that DOJ attorney, Dreven, would tell me is, oh, it's uh, there's congressional oversight. Oh, really? Um, and that congressional oversight has been able to, over the last, say, several years, um, hold b- bad actors or at least people in positions of authority who have, at minimum, minimum, committed ethical breaches. That's not me saying it. That's like the DOJ inspector general saying that about Jim Comey and Andy McCabe. And uh, I uh, am told there's congressional oversight and this is who holds the prosecutors and their law and their their investigative arm, the FBI accountable, really. And uh, I'm still waiting for Christopher Ray to tell me whether there were or were not FBI assets on the ground on January 6th, for example. The same uh, FBI that uh, abused FISA, the same FBI, in in terms of spying on Americans, in in addition to in terms of spying on the Trump campaign. All of the ethical breaches over the last eight years, the FBI agent who forged a email, Kevin Kleinsmith, one of the few actually prosecuted modestly at that. Um, But again, oh, sure, there's some exceptions, but generally speaking, no, 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 no. Maybe once upon a time, generally speaking, you could give the benefit of the doubt. Um, What we see now, you have to be out of your mind if you think that the people who have behaved the way that they have behaved in positions of uh, substantial power, are to be given the benefit of the doubt. You have to be out of your mind. Willful, I mean, it, willful blindness doesn't cover it. The performance of the last couple of FBI directors, the performance of this attorney general, the performance of federal prosecutors and special counsels. Uh, we're not even to the state prosecutors and state uh, uh, attorneys general like we just talked about in Arizona with Chris Mays or in Michigan with Dana Nussel. Out of your mind. You think that is what pr- it protects the republic, those institutions, as manifestly, spectacularly, publicly corrupt as they've demonstrated themselves to be? I mean, I, I know that uh, the Supreme Court is not the place for such rhetorical flourishes, and I know you're not going to get such rhetorical flourishes from an Alito or a Thomas, but it had to be crossing their minds yesterday during oral arguments. For more on all this, we're pleased to be joined by uh, Mark Pulliam. Mark is uh, an attorney himself, 
Uh, thus, we can ensure that he holds himself to the highest ethical standards, just like all those prosecutors at DOJ. He's a lawyer and writer living in East Tennessee. He blogs at misruleoflaw.com. Mark, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Good morning, Dan. Please be here. Uh, so, um, I mean, you know, we, we can start with the Arizona indictment, since that probably more closely approximates uh, the recent piece you wrote on John Eastman in terms of relevance. Um and 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 they're more uh, yet to come potentially, as uh, we as I just alluded to, with the Michigan investigation by the attorney general there into the alternative, uh, the alternate elector slate there. Um, that w- w- why is what's happening, whether it's in Fulton County or Arizona or Michigan, um, to uh, John Eastman, but not limited to John Eastman? Why 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 is this important? Well, as you pointed out in your uh, opening comments, the legal system in America has historically been viewed as the mechanism for protecting and defending individual rights, for preserving our liberty. But in the hands of the left in recent years, it has been weaponized as now a tool of oppression. And what is happening to John Eastman and other attorneys representing Uh, Republican elected officials, in particular President Trump, is that they've turned the tables and are now demonizing these lawyers and seeking to ruin them through lawfare, which is using legal and criminal proceedings to destroy your political opponents. But in the case of John Eastman and these other attorneys, Jeff Clark is one, Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton, they're going after also, is they're trying to really uh, revolutionize the role of lawyers uh, who have, by zealously representing unpopular clients throughout American history, starting with John Adams representing the British soldiers accused of uh, murdering civilians in the so-called Boston Massacre in 1770, but going on through the civil rights movement, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her litigation on behalf of women's rights, the ACLU, et cetera, we've celebrated these people because they've pushed the limits of the law to achieve social change. The difference is that social change was considered legally or uh, desirable from a policy standpoint from the left. Now that you have Republican or conservative lawyers pushing the limits zealously representing their clients in legal proceedings that the left hates that and is seeking to destroy these people and are succeeding that you know donald trump is the subject of a lot of this lawfare but he's a billionaire he has a public pulpit but these individual attorneys like john eastman you know he's not a rich man and so when he's hauled before a congressional committee he faces disbarment proceedings and in, uh, in California that go on for an unprecedented 35 days and, uh, and so forth, he's, he's becoming financially ruined. He's had to spend a million and a half dollars so far, and the Georgia proceedings haven't even really warmed up. Mm-hmm. And on Wednesday of this week, as you mentioned, Arizona has now indicted him and others. It's, it is a, a calculated campaign to not just ruin John Eastman and these other individual lawyers, but to send an unmistakable message to other lawyers in private practice that if you ever think about intervening in an election to try to uh, challenge an election that is won by a Democrat, we will ruin you, we will destroy your career, we will try to deprive you of your livelihood. And this is a very scary thing happening in America. Well, how is it a crime, though, to provide legal advice? I mean, that's what's the crime? Well, this is uh, it's like being in Alice in Wonderland. They uh, they've decided that any challenge to an election is equivalent to uh, insurrection, even though Democrats have challenged elections. Uh, and are celebrated for doing so. Hillary Clinton is still challenging the results of the 2016 election. Yep. And they say that, uh, you know, particular legal advice was fraudulent. It was dishonest. It was a conspiracy. It's 
flimsy, but and he will, I think, eventually, if he can muster the resources to defend himself, he will prevail in all of these myriad forums. But this is the, the real evil of lawfare, is that the process is the punishment. You know, I'll if, tell you, I, I, to, I just I just want to zero in on something you just said about Eastman, because it's just it's some it's, we see a pattern. So there are no victims in the uh, civil trial about uh, the Trump organ uh, the, related to the Trump organization. You know, all the banks are fine. Uh, nobody cried foul. Um, but the attorney general steps in. There is no victim in the uh, quote-unquote business records case, which, as I was just reminded, isn't even a business records case because the checks came out of his personal account. Um, (laughs) There's no victim there. And with respect to John Eastman, the fraudulent legal advice, quote-unquote, there's also no victim because his client isn't crying foul. So, uh, I mean, it's... And and all of the electoral votes were counted on January 6th. Correct. on schedule. So there's nothing nothing to remedy. Yes. Yes. Right. I mean, it's just it's and, and the other thing I just I want to emphasize, too, because you're right about the, the message this sends and that Republicans are on notice. Republican lawyers, anybody in the federal society, anybody Leonard Leo's ever had lunch with, you're on notice that we're going to try to get you disbarred and imprisoned if you get uh, if you dip your toe into politics. The other th- message it sends to their side's attorneys is um, do everything you can everywhere, any, anywhere and everywhere you are to put your political opponents in this box that Trump is in, get them off the campaign trail, uh, you know, bankrupt them or have them expend resources, personal and political. This is this is, you know, polit- the lawfare. It's it's po- politics by other means. This is just uh, aggressive campaigning. Put them in uh, in the criminal defendant's chair and let them expend their time and resources while you're out campaigning. And if you could do it at the presidential level, then why not do it in governor's races or Senate races or congressional races? And that's their goal. So we have a complete lack of symmetry on this. So Mark Elias and his fellow Democrat lawyers can sue all these different states in 2020 to challenge uh, existing election laws to permit, uh, you know, uh, wide open uh, mail ballots and ballot harvesting and make changes that were not approved by the state legislatures. And that's considered okay. That's celebrated. But if any Republican lawyer pushes back or tries to resist that, they become the subject. And this is an organized campaign. It's not just organic, accidental. David Brock and his 65 Project, which is a dark money, left-wing organization, they have targeted specific lawyers. And they even say, and if they are modest of modest means, it makes it a more vulnerable target. And that's why we're going after the little guys, because if you can destroy the little guys, then you're really sending a strong message. It's pernicious, and your listeners should realize if they can get away with this with John Eastman, a former Supreme Court clerk, uh, you know, graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, practice law at Kirkland and Ellis, he is a, a stellar legal talent. Uh, but if they can destroy him, they could go after any one of your listeners. They've, they've deplatformed him from his banking relationships. They picket his house. They they put tire strip uh, nail strips across his driveway to flatten his tires. He is being persecuted. What for? What reason? Because he defended President Donald Trump in the 2020 election. This is should be. This should shock your listeners. And this should not be happening in America. And we can't let them succeed. Mark Pulliam is a lawyer and writer living in East Tennessee. He blogs at MissRuleOfLaw.com. Mark, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. The more you listen, the more you listen, the more you'll know. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Morning Answer on AM 560. The Answer. This is Albert Moeller for townhall.com. In 1972, Congress passed Title IX. This legislation offered the promise of equity to girls and women in terms of the educational and athletic opportunities previously known only by boys and men. Just last week, President Biden passed by executive action an update to Title IX, inserting the words gender identity to the groups that are a protected class. But understand what this means. If a man claims to be a woman or a girl, he must be treated as a woman or a girl. 
biological males who claim to be females will now have the same protections and be included in the same programs that were intended to assist girls and women to achieve equity. Don't believe the government when it tells you that's not going to happen. Let's be clear. You can't have equity for girls and women and support the transgender agenda. You can't do so at the same time. Effectively, the Biden administration has just made a huge declaration. Women and girls, you can kiss Title IX goodbye. I'm Albert Moeller.